Welcome to the Real Freedom Podcast, where we inspire you to pursue your passion to gain time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. I'm your host, Mike Swenson. Let's get some real freedom together. All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Real Freedom Stories. And I'm so excited to share today, we've got Ty Morgan here. And when you think about financial freedom, Um, It's about having the ability to do the things that you want to do and sometimes the things that you need to do because life comes up and, and, uh, you know, we can't always plan for everything. And so Ty is somebody that has overcome uh, challenges and obstacles in his life. Um, And so, you know, you never really know uh, what your financial needs are, what your life needs are. And so that's why when we talk about the pursuit of financial and time freedom, it's for things like that that are coming up. So um, so just a little bit about Ty. So he is the founder of Infinite Planning, uh, where his goal is to educate and inspire individuals to take control of their financial lives through proper education and coaching. Uh, He's also founded a nonprofit organization uh, called Silent Guardian Angels, Inc., and is here to share um, his family's incredible story of overcoming odds and how financial freedom has allowed you guys um, to be able to do that. So welcome, Ty. We're so excited to have you. Why don't you just take a couple minutes and tell a little bit more about you? Hey, Mike. Yeah, super excited to be here and thankful for the opportunity to share with your audience um, yeah, I grew up a uh, very small town in Alabama and uh, went to college at West Alabama where I played football. And then I went on to the University of Alabama and got my master's um, in personal finance because I knew that's something that's very important when you're going through life. And I wanted to educate people in the future. Um, so it's always been something that has grabbed my attention um, and how I grew up. And then after, after graduating from the University of Alabama, uh, my wife and I, we made the move to Florida. Uh, we love the sunny weather down here. And uh, we have our, our daughter, Blakely, who's seven. And uh, we just had our our son, Brayson, who is just yesterday is nine months old, and uh, those children have changed our lives, and now we're on the way with number three, so number three is on the way, so the family's growing. Congratulations. Yeah, that's that's really exciting, and and life uh, certainly can throw some some obstacles at you, so yeah, why don't you just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the challenges that you guys have experienced uh, this past year as parents? Yeah, absolutely. So we have our daughter Blakely and we knew we wanted to have more children. And uh, so we started trying in 2020 um, for our second child, Brayson. In June of 2020, um, we conceived Brayson. And for the first three months, everything was good to go in utero. Um, Brayson was developing nicely. All the ultrasounds, the checkups were doing great. Um, And around September 16th, uh, we were at a normal visit and they had trouble in the ultrasound actually seeing Brayson. Um, so obviously that's a concern. That means that there's low fluid because the ultrasound um, uses fluid to be able to see the baby in utero. Um, so two weeks later, they had referred us to a specialist on September 29th. We went to that specialist's office in Florida. And we well, this is during COVID time, so I'm not allowed into the doctor's office. I'm in the car waiting, FaceTime my wife. And mm-hmm. she's in there for about an hour um, getting an ultrasound done. And so from that September 16th to September 29th visit, the visibility had gotten worse. They're having an even harder time seeing Brayson. And uh, after that hour long, the technician went out of the room and she came back in and said, uh, your husband's allowed in. The doctor needs to speak to both of you. So at that time, I'm going to face some of my wife. And I know after an hour long ultrasound, something isn't quite right and the news isn't going to be good. Um, so I'm walking in into the room. My wife's in there. And at this time, she's on FaceTime with her mom. And uh, I walk in the room. And the first thing I just say to my wife is, no matter what this doctor says, uh, we're not aborting this child. Um, I don't know. I just before I went in, I said a quick prayer to God because I'm, I'm a man of faith. And uh, I didn't know what to say. So I said, God, if you can just put words in my mouth, I'm not going to know what to say to my wife. That was the first statement I made. And about two to three minutes later, the doctor came into the room. Uh, and the first words out of his mouth were, I know a really nice, or he gave us the diagnosis, which is bilateral renal agenesis. That means complete absence of kidneys and, um, no bladder. And that is a hundred percent lethal condition. Um, and the reason why is because the kidneys produce amniotic fluid, which helps children, the babies in utero develop their lungs. So that's why it's hundred percent fatal. So he gave us the, the diagnosis. And then his first statement after that was, I know a really nice abortion clinic I can refer you guys to. Or the second option is we can go full term with this child and it'll be stillborn. Um, and you may meet him for five minutes. Um, so just the way I grew up, uh, hard nose in Alabama, hardworking and not giving up. 
Uh, I didn't like either one of those options. I said, me and my wife, obviously the emotional toll uh, was pretty great getting that news. Um, but we took it and we went to work and did our research and we found out there was a clinical trial going on, a brand new clinical trial in 2020 um, for these children called the RAF trial. And so we enrolled in that and went through uh, the extensive uh, extensive parts it takes to get into the trial and we were accepted. And in November, we moved uh, to Baltimore, Maryland for the trial. And uh, we, we, my wife completed 25 total amnio infusions. Uh, and then Brayson was born on January 21st, 2021. Wow, that's, it's such an amazing story. And, and obviously, we'll, we'll dig into more after that. But um, yeah, I mean, you never, you never know what life's going to throw at you. And, you know, sticking to your morals is really important. But at the same time, like stuff costs money and life happens and we have jobs that we have to work. And a lot of times people don't plan for that stuff when they're thinking about, you know, building wealth or what does my career look like? What are my choices in my career? Um, life happens. And, and you guys certainly were, were an example of that. So, um, yeah. So and, and then to just just share a little bit, you know, since birth up to now, um, how things are going. I know you spent a long time in the hospital after that, too. Um, and then we'll kind of go back and, and talk about, you know, career life, what happens when in the face of something like this, but yeah, what's, what's kind of been the last year, like since birth or nine months, I guess. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So he was born January 21st, 2021. These babies have a 0% chance of life. Um, but with this trial, actually what happens is the 25 amnio infusions. I'll break that down for everyone. An amnio infusion is just simply saline solution um, that gets injected into the womb um, and goes into the baby's utero sac. And that acts as the fluid for them to swallow to be able to develop their lungs. Um, so during those 25 amnio infusions, Brayson was able to develop his lungs wonderfully. It came out kicking and screaming like any other baby. And obviously we knew that he was missing his kidneys, so we had to take action on that. So mm -hmm. his first day of life, uh, what occurred is he had three surgeries. He had a PD catheter, peritoneal dialysis catheter place. And what that uh, item does is access his kidneys. So fluid comes in and comes out and pulls waste out and would act as his kidneys. Um, he got a G2 place for feeding, just, just in case he wasn't able to take things orally, um, just safety measure. And then we put in a central line called a Broviac that uh, gives access to the veins. Um, so he had three surgeries on his first day of life and he handled it like a champ. And then what we do for the peritoneal dialysis catheters is you, you wanna give it time to heal because um, that thing is vital for, for life. So we, we gave it 11 days before we tried to use it. And then we went to use it on the 11th day and it was clogged and it wouldn't work. Um, so with that, it required additional an additional surgery. So we went back for revision on his peritoneal dialysis catheter and he came back from the revision surgery. This time it was leaking. So two days later, he went back in for another revision surgery and he had his third surgery on that peritoneal dialysis catheter. Um, so it just kind of wreaked havoc on his, uh, his stomach area and it just wouldn't work. So we got into quite a bit of a bind with this, with this health, um, because that peritoneal dialysis catheter wouldn't work. And so throughout his whole stay, he stayed 225 days in the NICU. He had 14 total surgeries. Um, and we think that, you know, seven to eight of those surgeries could have been prevented if that peritoneal dialysis catheter functioned properly. So what me and my wife decided to do after that third revision surgery is to start Silent Guardian Angels. And now we're working on um, developing a new peritoneal dialysis catheter that won't get clogged on the inside. Um, but Brayson came home on my wife's birthday after 225 days, and he's home with us now uh, at a month and a half. And uh, he's, doing, he's doing great. I mean, given the odds of 0% chance of life and also um, having all the additional surgeries that the little guy had to have, he's doing great. And I'm happy to have him home. So it's been a blessing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure big sister's excited and uh, doing an awesome job as well. Yeah, she is. Blakely does a wonderful job. Brayson does not like to be held by his parents as much, but when his sister holds him, he's just sleeping as content can be. So uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, yeah, I mean, we just, we just kind of got into it in terms of you know what's, what's been happening in your life as a, as a dad and as a husband. Um, but uh, let's let's kind of stop and go back a little bit, right? Because because you have so you you founded Infinite Planning. Um, why don't you just talk a little bit about that and, and kind of what led up to that? Um, because obviously, for instances like this, you know, when when we talk about building time and financial freedom, like you you need to have 
opportunities to step in and be a dad and be a husband when, when you have to. And so, um, you know, that's where, um, it's, imp it's important to plan ahead. So, so let's talk about Ty, the professional now <laughs> outside of Ty, the dad and, and talk a little bit about, about that. Yeah, sure. They're both still kind of intertwined. So the idea of infinite planning actually came from, I was working a corporate job nine to five. I was making over six figures at a company car, company phone, company credit card, all those things, um, which on paper is great. But the problem was I had to work three hours away from home. So I'm, I'm commuting and going to work and, and running the business that I needed to for the corporate side. Um, but when you're, your five, four and five year old daughters chasing you out the door at 4.30 a.m. on a Monday, it's not a good feeling. So I knew things had to change. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had the personal finance uh, masters and I had business experience. So I wanted to combine those two. And so I found it infinite planning. And that's where I educate and inspire people uh, with financial literacy. Um, so I'm thankful I did start that when I did because I started that in January of 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, come, you know, September of 2020, uh, we had to make that leap of faith for Brayson. And uh, I set money aside and, and different items that we use and I, I coach on now. Um, and I thought I was going to use those to expand my business, but I actually had to do both. So I expanded my business and also um, use those funds for the moves and relocations for Brayson to be born. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it came to my corporate job, and this is why it's so important, and I preach to people about time first, you know, then money to buy your freedom, uh, is because the corporate job I had, as great as it was, I asked for a relocation. Uh, and they actually denied it and offered me a $75,000 pay decrease to work a remote position. I said, no, thank you. And I went to work my business and got a couple of contracts and I'm doing better now than I was at my corporate position. So really blessed and thankful for that. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes it, it you know, I think people who are, are hesitant to make a leap, um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's going to be challenges and, you know, there are unknowns out there. Um, but at the same time, you're never going to get to that unless you make that leap. And so I think, um, you know, it's it's scary to do that. And and yeah, I think a lot of times people wonder like, well, why would I leave such a high paying job? Well, it's because you want to be <clears throat> you want to be home. You want to be with your family. And uh, and and yeah, it, it takes it takes letting go. Um, but but you're not going to be able to build that life that you want without being able to do that. So. Um, yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the coaching that you do, the financial literacy, um, you know, what are the things that you're teaching folks um, through infinite planning? Yeah. So, and what I did with infinite planning is I took what I learned in my master's program, the, the 10 basic pillars, and I signed those um, on there, but the fifth pillar, which is the infinite banking concept, which is what really helped me get my business going and, and save us through um, the, the bracing journey. So the infinite banking concept or IBC was derived by R. Nelson Nash in the 1980s. Um, and the infinite banking concept is basically learning the banking process. So it's an individual learning the banking process and applying it at the you and me level. So obviously there's Chase banks, there's Wells Fargo's banks. They're all practicing banking every day. Um, there's actually a way for individuals to do the same thing. And that's through the infinite banking concept. And that's just really important in your life because every day banking occurs, whether you know it or not. And once you become aware of it and you learn that process, you're able to take advantage of it. Um, and the key to the infinite banking concept is imagination. So you really got to be uh, able to use your imagination and think outside the box. So like as an employee, when I was in my nine to five, I was stuck in my box. But as I became a business owner and learned there's a lot more to the financial world, uh, you get outside your box and you think differently. So that's really the key to it. And um, that's a key pillar that we teach on there. Mm hmm. Okay, cool. So you had mentioned, or I see here uh, that, you know, you manage uh, $30 million in revenue and real estate combined. Talk a little bit about more about that. <clears throat> yeah. And so I can kind of, I can kind of give an example of how those uh, work together. So I, I do own another consulting business that is focused in agricultural labor consulting. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do, what we're doing for a client right now is we're taking the infinite banking concept we're putting approximately $500,000 into a policy for him, specifically designed for him and his needs and what we're trying to do. And we're going out and we're gonna acquire more real estate for him. So what that's gonna do is in the first year, we're putting in $500,000. He has 300,000 available to use. We're gonna go acquire about a $1.5 million real estate deal, which is um, just the math that we've ran and the numbers potentially with this deal, about $100,000 additional year in income for him. And so we're going to repeat this for the first four years. 
And what it's going to look like at the end of the first four years is we used the, we we built this capital pool of about two million dollars. It's going to have about one point one million dollars in cash value, and these inside this infinite banking concept policy is going to have acquired real estate of about four point five million dollars. This passive income is going to also increase to about three hundred thousand dollars. And the fifth fifth way is that three hundred thousand dollars per year. Yeah, <clears throat> per year in in the business deals that we're structuring for him. Um, it's, it's a unique type in the agricultural labor um, world's unique type of business, um, commercial, commercial real estate deals that we're going to take down. Um, and, you know, as well as most people do in real estate, there's a lot of tax benefits that come with those deals as well. Um, mm-hmm. So that's pretty exciting and a project that we're working on now. So what are, what are the types of commercial deals that are done? Is it, is it just land then, or is it buildings yeah. and land or what, what type of stuff is he acquiring? Yeah, so we're acquiring land, uh, and we'd require buildings too if they met the specs. Uh, but we're going to acquire land and put buildings on them specifically for the labor that he provides to farmers. Um, so there's really it's, it's the way the the way the companies are set up. Um, it generates guaranteed income because farmers obviously to get consumers to get consumers the product they got to have labor, and we provide both the labor and the housing. Um, right now they only do the labor, and we're making that transition into providing the housing because right now the money is flowing. To hotels, I want to bring that that cash flow back into the business. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so go okay. So go back then. I just want to retouch because you you rattled off a lot of numbers. So right now he has about five hundred thousand dollars in real estate land. So so what no, was yeah. the five hundred? So, and then you had four and a half million. I'm just trying to understand kind of how that how that process works. Yeah, yeah. So what we're doing is, um, so first off, we're setting up his infinite banking concept policy. So we're going to build his banking system. So mm-hmm. he has 500000 of liquidity. Mm-hmm. So we're going to put 500000 into his infinite banking concept policy. So in the first year, you only have about uh, 62% of the cash value to use inside these policies. So we're going to okay. take that $300,000 and use it as a down payment on his real estate transaction. There we go. Okay, got it. Yeah. <clears throat> And so the real that real estate we're estimating uh, right around 1.5 million after acquisition of land and building, and then running the numbers off what we can charge for the employees, it'll produce a cash flow of a minimum of $100,000 per year. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then there's there that's the first site, and then a couple of years we're going to do that for two additional sites after the first one. Okay. And what state is that located in? Uh, we're going the three states we're going to is Tennessee. Uh, then we're going to Illinois and Texas. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So it's definitely a different, I mean, a different take on real estate. Um, but then too, I mean, the purpose of, <clears throat> you know, why a lot of people want to invest in real estate is because there's a cash flow that comes in, right. And it helps build you um, financial freedom where instead of sticking all of your money into stocks or something like that, where you have to wait till you retire or like a 401k, wait till you retire before you can draw those funds. Now he's able to get cash flow every month um, through opportunities in real estate. So um, yeah, so that's, that's certainly helpful. So then how are you identifying kind of which properties to target? Is that something that you help with or he's already identified those? Yeah, so in my other my other consulting business, there's a, there's a partner that helps with uh, finding out the real estate uh, and these things. Just the nature of agricultural labor and why we're consultants in it is it's good and bad. So it's heavily regulated by the government. So there's a lot of the specs that we have to go through and get approved. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that kind of narrows it down. And then once we get past you know the larger government entities, the local government entities, we have to go in the go in there and make sure we're meeting their requirements. Uh, mm-hmm. And so sometimes these projects take a little longer, but we, we actually just get boots on the ground and where we provide labor and then we're scouting out uh, the land and or buildings that we need. And then once we acquire the land and or buildings, we have to remodel it and or build, build out the real estate to meet uh, the other government entities because it, it has very specific criteria you have to meet in order to house these employees. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's just a totally different take on real estate and investing in real estate. Cause obviously more of what we've talked about is, is kind of your, your residential, your commercial or multifamily and that kind of stuff, but, but also exposing people that, yeah, there's a lot that there's a lot of other stuff that happens inside of real estate and, and agriculture is one of them. 
Um, do you, are, are there people now, is, is your client somebody that's grew up in agriculture, has been in agriculture their whole life? I'm just kind of curious for somebody that might want to get interested or might be interested in it maybe in more of a passive way or something like that. Like how would somebody get, get into, you know, what you're, what you're doing? Yeah, I know specifically the clients that I work with now, they, they, they've grown up in this business. Um, mm-hmm. And I took them on as clients as far as the financial coaching side. And after working with them, I said, hey, there's this huge real estate opportunity for you that you're missing out on. So we kind of transitioned into that. Mm-hmm. As far as passive, I don't necessarily know about uh, in the, how, the real estate specifically. I mean, I do know of other opportunities to invest in farmland. Um, but that are outside of the housing. So the, the housing is kind of a new take on investing that we just happened to find as we were digging through their businesses. And mm-hmm. their big thing is, hey, I want to live a more passive lifestyle because obviously the business sometimes is a lot is, is kind of draining and running the businesses. Mm-hmm. So that's where we're making that transition to real estate and we're digging through all the details of, of the housing. And maybe in the future, that could be something that we create to have passive income opportunities um, mm-hmm. for other other people outside. You know, we we talk about financial freedom and, and obviously it's, it's important for you guys and you guys have been able to experience it firsthand. Um, what have you seen in some of the people that you've worked with in terms of, you know, what, what does financial freedom mean to them or how would it play out in their lives when, when you do have that passive income coming in or you are growing your investments to where you have freedom to kind of do the time stuff, like you said, start with time and get to, to finances after that. How has that played out in, in what you've seen from some of the clients you've worked with? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the big thing uh, for the clients that I've worked with, they've been primarily business owners. Mm-hmm. And the, the big thing there is obviously when you're running a business, uh, it's sometimes it can take a lot of time if you don't step back and you, you strategically look at everything you're doing. So we take a strategic view at the business. Where can we cut uh, you know time inefficiencies? And then where can we identify your cash cash flow variables as well. So like, for example, one other client that I work with, um, you know, they've been in business for 10 to 15 years and they never knew their cash flow projections or made a projection or built the actual budget spreadsheet. Um, so even mm-hmm. basic things like that, going into a business and making sure that we're just giving them visibility um, would really help clients. And then transition into that time freedom, another client that I've worked with, you know, his business has been running him and I'm teaching him how to actually run the business. So it's the other way around. And he's been able to cut time out and really focus on family time, which for me, that's the biggest win. Um, if you can cut out, you know, people's time and they can make uh, important, important uh, strategic moves in their life. So that's been a big, big win that I've been able to achieve for that client. Yeah. And I think that's, a, I mean, those, those basic financial principles are so important. You know, somebody obviously has been running a business, like you mentioned, without, without cash flow projections and stuff like that. Like they've ran a business for a long time and haven't really kind of gone back to the, the basic core, which is knowing your numbers. And I know in, you know, various businesses for anybody that's listening to this podcast, there's people that do a great job at that. And then there's people that don't. And understanding your numbers is really important because it, it helps you to, to make plans for the future, right? Versus, you know, what we don't want to see happen is people just run their business year after year after year, and you get 10 or 15 years down the road and you, you don't know what you have to show for it. You haven't grown it maybe in the way that you can, and you're maybe missing an opportunity um, to take something where, what if you could make the same income instead of you being 100% active in your business, you were 100% passive in your business, um, you know, and, and you're, you make the same income. That's where the planning and the proactivity is so important. And that's where you get a chance to help people see that um, because, yeah, they're, they're busy running in their business, not necessarily working on their businesses. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, Mike. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, another big thing, too, that when we finally did get the numbers, I'm like, hey, guys, there's a massive. Uh, labor shortage in America right now is the time to grow and build more passive income. So now that we we see the numbers, uh, we can take them and we can grow their businesses as well. And instead of them working harder, we can work smarter. So um, mm-hmm. that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why don't we take just, just a few seconds here then too. I mean, I know it's, it's newer for you, but, but talk about silent guardian angels. Um, you know, obviously we, we heard your story of why you started it, but what, what do you want to see happen with that growing forward? Yeah, so where we're at right now is in, obviously, we started this, uh, number one, to build new peritoneal dialysis catheter prototypes, uh, and then number two, to be able to give back to families that will face similar impossible odds in the future. And right now, where we're at in that catheter design is in February, we kicked off. Um, now we're at the patent 
uh, patent. We're, we're going to apply for the patent on the first design that we have. And then we're going to have to build a prototype and go to the manufacturers. Um, so, and I didn't know this. I'm learning a lot of new things as we go through this nonprofit. Um, mm -hmm. So when you get into medical devices, uh, there's a lot of time and FDA uh, involvement. Uh, so there'll be, even though we can go build this prototype and get in the patent, we're probably about three years out um, on this item. And so uh, that's, that's the peritoneal dialysis catheter. And then the second objective is to be able to give back to family. So the, the, the strategy there is to put that patent on by the nonprofit. Anything that's generated off this uh, catheter will be able to give to other families as we go. So that's the main goal. And if anyone wants to support, we'd, we'd love the support. And uh, that's that's kind of the goal and mission of Silent Guardian Angels. So I'm learning a lot about nonprofit. I knew a lot about for-profit businesses, but the nonprofit is a new space. And uh, I think in September, we just got our official IRS later saying we are nonprofits. So that's exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations on that. Such, such an amazing story, Ty. You've got, you know, you're you're running your own business you're helping people run their businesses, helping them build financial freedom. And then life comes up and, and life throws a curveball at you and, and you take it and you run with it. And now you're turning it into something else good through this nonprofit organization. So, you know, for, for people out there that maybe feel stuck in their jobs, maybe feel like, um, you know, I have to answer to a boss. I don't have the, the freedom. They probably look at you and are maybe a little bit overwhelmed at everything that that's happened to you and everything that you've done over the last couple of years. But what advice would you give to people that are maybe wanting to be their own boss, just kind of finally jump in and do that and, and kind of maybe go into the waters of the unknown a little bit? What, what advice would you have for people based on what you've experienced? Yeah. Number one, you got to take action. So my, my wife, all throughout our first couple of years together, she said she was giving me an idea jar. So I was always full of ideas, never action. But as soon as I decided to take the leap of faith and take action, that's when things started to happen. So what I mean by that is find a mentor, find a coach, uh, whether that be online or someone you meet with regularly, um, you got to do that. So that's the first step. Number two, no matter how hard it gets or impossible it seems, don't give up. You know, your, your hope is on the way. Um, so that would definitely be the, the advice that I give. And then don't be afraid to fail. I mean, failing, I'd say fail forward. Um, mm -hmm. Failure is, is never bad. You can fail forward in everything you do. I've tried a lot of different things in my business. And, you know, every day I may make little subtle changes because there's always ways to get better and fail forward. Um, so that's the advice that I would give to people. And it's always better to be your own boss than having a boss. So <laughs> definitely take the leap of faith sooner than later. I, I wish I'd have done it sooner. So for folks that want to find out more about infinite planning, folks that want to find more about silent guardian angels, how can they get a hold of you or just, just go research more um, about what you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. So infinite planning is www.infiniteplanning.org, um, O-R-G. And you, there's a link there. You, you can schedule a call with me. Um, and then silent guardian angels is www.silentguardianangels.com. Um, you can reach out to us there on the contact us page. Um, so infinite planning, anyone that's needing coaching or guidance um, in your, your, your life as far as business goes, we can help you there. And then for the nonprofit, if you know anyone facing impossible circumstances um, and that need guidance on, you know, life journey that they're told they can't do something uh, in regards to health, we can help you there. So that's, that's the best way to reach out to us, Mike. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. I mean, such a inspiring story, you know, just life coming at you and, and you've got to be able to cut and run and, and go with it. And, and you guys are persevering and working through it. And so uh, just a great inspiration to others. So thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. I appreciate it so much. Mike.